<laughs> to those that don't know him, Dr. Todd Gray, MBE, is a historian whose principal research lies with, within the history of Devon. He's an honorary research fellow at Exeter University and the author of more than 50 books on Devon. Todd leads the Heritage Advisory Group for the Big Project, who have been guiding our team of community researchers in their work. And we'll now hear Todd's summary of the research that's being produced. Well, uh, first of all, thank, I want to thank everybody who's done work and apologize. Um, COVID has gotten in the way of how we wanted to work. We had to adapt ourselves. And I know a number of people have found it a bit frustrating not been able to get access and not been able to meet and none of us thought we would look forward, look backwards to the happy days of Brexit and we had to worry about that. I, mean, I think what people have managed to come up with has been very good and very useful. Um, and it's, it's difficult to do this kind of history. If you're doing an academic article, you know only a few people are going to write it, uh, read it, and most people aren't even going to be interested in it. And you just write for them and that's it. If you're writing something very general, you can get away with that. But with this, it's all sorts of people. And that's harder. There will be people who will have been born and bred in Exeter and never really thought about the character of St. David's. And it's an odd parish. You know, when you look at the buildings here, they are a little bit better than they should be across the rest of Exeter. I mean, they're grander. Um, St. Leonard's may have the space around the buildings that we don't always have here, but this is an impressive area of terraces. And that question is, who are the people that come here? And how have as this parish related to the rest of the city, to all sorts of various questions which people have tried to answer in sections. And what I'm going to do is talk to you about some of the things which have come out, but not all. I've had to drop some, so I've dropped Anna. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Thinking, because you're a leader, it doesn't matter as much. No, that's fine. But we can come back to it. Um, so how is that must have been the school, Exeter Community Center, the Flays, Thomas and Elizabeth Flay, who are also very important early on, um, but we're gonna to come to that in a different way. Now, I'm gonna go through as they went um, in our file, which was put together by Russ and what everybody's been doing. And I'm hoping Somebody may be interested in, for your own reasons, or maybe even contributing this at a very late date if you do it very, 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 very quickly. Um, in the Devon Archaeological Society Journal, which has only been out a few weeks, there's a report on the church and the Roman finds that are there. And it's a very interesting thing for this parish because we don't have much material. And did I write down some of it? Oh, I did. 2016 to 2017 excavations done by Mark Stein Metzer. Roman tile production here for the city. Unusual finds. Um, there's another report from 1985 to 1986 about Lower North Street and X Street. So that little corner, um, two cremations, a quarry pit, and a timber building of the first and third century. So it gives us a completely different way of looking at the parish and reminds us for 2,000 years plus there have been people living here. Now, if anybody is interested in that thought, if you have a look, I'll show you which pages. And what I'll do is I'll photograph them and I can send them on we transfer so they can show up in. If four or five people just want to read it, that's fine. But if somebody wants to write it up, I just thought it would make a nice addition to what we've been doing. The tile kiln main body is underneath the church, and just a little bit of it is sticking out when they were doing the dig. And included in the finds is some Samian ware from France from about 2,000 years ago. 
So it's a nice little thing. We could plan for this. I didn't know that this was coming out in the DAS journal until it popped through the door a couple of weeks ago. Otherwise, we would have tried to get a copy of the report earlier. So that's one thing we can think about. Abigail. What's interesting with Abigail's piece is that little slant on what we know, but we don't look twice at because we know it, or if we're new to the parish, we don't necessarily notice it. And that's the clock tower, 1897. And that little twist is the animal rights section. And it's modern, and yet it's very Victorian. The Victorian concern for animals, um, the move for vegetarianism, which tended to involve maiden ladies of a certain age who were vegetarian. Um, very different from the earlier vegetarian movement in the 18th century. Well, that is about animals, that clock tower. William and Louisa Miles, um, who pushed forward the Exeter Cart Horse Parade, concerned about the lives of working horses in Exeter. And you may know that history already, but when you look at it afresh, you think that is easy for us to bring alive to people who may or may not have noticed it before. And that is what I think is happening in all of these things. So Alice and Allison, I don't see Alice is now. I'll leave you on the corner. It's absolutely superb work. It's just such a nice, nice piece on Florence Parks. Um, now she is the woman that I did talk about before, but Allison has brought it forward in ways in which I didn't do. And this is a very interesting woman who is an early midwife. She runs a nursing home for mothers and babies between the clock tower and the prison. Um, she's a local girl who has a baby in her charge who dies at I'm not sure how old, months old. Seven weeks. Yeah. Just a tiny, tiny little thing. She goes to prison along with the mother. She claims her innocence. There's a long campaign by her to um, be acquitted of the charge. She's vilified in Exeter. And then 1935, she's pardoned. 1,000 pounds she's given as a um, as compensation. And there's a paper in London that says, plucky girl, you know, our, our English nurse who, who was wrongly convicted. That tone, very different from the woman who was catcalling her during the First World War when the baby died. And it's a good example for us of history, which you can look at it this way, and you can look at it that way. Was she? actually responsible. She may not have killed the child, but it was in her care. Well, later on the government decided differently than the press and the court had decided in the field hall in 1917-1918. Um, and the detail is tremendous in that. It deserves to be put in its entirety one way or another, not just for me to scavenge bits out of it to write a story. Um, mostly because it goes much further than I did. And, you know, that is really exciting, as everybody will see, when you see something you've done and then you see a bit more later on, you go, ah, oh, that makes more sense. Different from that, Carol Whitten. I don't think she's here. Carol? No, Carol's not Well, the worst piece to be um, stuck with, <laughs> yeah. General Buller. <laughs> You cannot make anybody happy with General Buller and the statue for all the reasons we know at the moment. It's a bit like having an opinion on Harry and Meghan. Somebody's going to get offended by what you say. Well, General Buller, how do we reinterpret it? Do we celebrate the past or do we reckon <coughs> with it and atone for it? Two divided opinions with the majority of the population in the middle. Carol's been very sensitive. But no matter what you write, there's something which is going to offend somebody, particularly if you want to be offended. And I think that's where we are with this sort of topic at the moment. Um, you haven't spoken about it in the right way. Your capitalization is important. Your terminology is important. 
Um, well, what she does is she talks about Adrian Jones, the sculptor. She gives us the date and the background and the enthusiasm, but opens up how do we look at this statue? How should it be dealt with without giving any advice? And what's good about it is it isn't any of the finger waving. It's not telling you how to think, it's not preaching. And you can do that with some bits of history. Um, the history of shoplifters is very easy because nobody's going to come up and be offended and tell you they're offended because I've been shoplifting all my life. How dare you write that about me? You're not going to have that. But with this subject, you are. And that is the one which I worried about. And we're still going to have to deal with it even more sensitively than perhaps um, we could have done. Um, so younger generation political parties, because it's a liberal party statue, which Carol brings out, erected in order to embarrass a conservative government in London. Exeter City Council putting two fingers up to the national government and using Buller. It's also interesting, as Carol brings out, it's the only statue in Exeter which the person who's being commemorated unveils himself, which is a <laughs> Fantastic thing. I give you me. <laughs> Nobody does that, but we have that with Bull. So it's an interesting piece with problems. Um, Diane Blake. Um, w. G., or a series of biographies, W.G. Hoskins, you know, figure we know. Um, St. David's boy goes to Oxford, he's at Leicester. There are problems with what he says of, as an Exeter City Councillor, which in the end, which don't bring out as much about the fact that he had Sells Library and he was pushed out of Exeter. So he escaped diplomatically around that. Because that's a, yet another problem, because the families are still here. And somebody might get upset with that. Um, but I think with him, and Exeter City Council and buildings, it's a lasting legacy in Exeter. Mm. And we have them on our doorstop. So that's one, John Dinham, merchant, philanthropist, um, tea importer, which some people see problems with now, and it's going to only increase over the next few years. Um, are they slaves? Are they in servitude? Luckily, we don't have to do that at the moment because the sensitivities aren't that high. Um, but his statue in uh, Rougemont is all about how he spent his adult years giving money to make institutions which are socially responsible happen. Not just Mount Dinham, but a number of other, in a way in which no excellent person has done before. And this is why, as you write, we write, thousands of people lie in the streets to see him off on his funeral. Very few people do we do that for, but we did it for dinner. And that's a mark of the esteem, I think, of people in Exeter. And they were ordinary people um, as well. Um, Martha Moody, the third one, our only slave holder, or owner, um, that we have in Exeter. St. David's that I know about and that you know about. Um, an odd woman. Um, she gets 2,406 pounds and 38 P in today's money for her slave. Um, she lived at Bystock Terrace. She comes into Exeter and then she leaves, like a lot of people of that type did. Not necessarily, particularly for the West Indies, that parapetat, moving all around. Um, and then the last one, the figure which I think is an enduring figure of fascination for, for the parish, William Gibbs. You know, the man connected with the church, built his fortune on guano um, in South America. <laughs> from that, he was able to construct some rather beautiful buildings. Um, but each of those four give the personal <coughs> side to the tens of thousands of people we could have picked, but these are the people who achieved and his left left material behind. So it's only a portion of what we have. Um, our other Hannah, Hannah um, Singleton, the well-known story of cholera, but it's the Exeter St. David's dimension of that awfulness in Burry Meadow of local people not wanting 
corpses from other parts of the city buried in their own backyard. Not knowing yet how the disease was spread, it was a concern. Um, I think what's particularly nice about the piece is we have the names of some of the dead who are often ignored. So you can see the ordinary nature of people across the city, which are included in that. Um, now, oh yes, and the um, other fun bit which I didn't know, Burry Meadow having been used as a site for organized fights with young lads, you know, bare fisted touching orphans um, going on for hours, and I hadn't realized that took place there. Knew along the river, but it didn't know Burry Meadow was. Um, so we have a <coughs> proud history of bare knuckle fighting, which Hannah is going to perform for us later on <laughs> today. Um, Jane Chapel, um, Mount Didham, <coughs> which must be the biggest area of uh, social housing that existed in Exeter until that date. Um, because it's slightly pushed out of the way, we don't think about it in the same way as you would in other estates. 44 houses or cottages uh, for the deserving poor or respectable people. Um, garden done by Veach. They had a full time gardener. Um, I was fascinated. I hadn't realized one of the people there was an ostrich feather dresser, <laughs> which I have absolutely no idea how they make that into a full time job. But good for him or her. I don't know. I assume he's a her, but you never know. Um, St. David's Institute. Um, building nearby 1905, legacy of Mr. West at Streatham Hall, um, library reading room with lectures in them, later St. David's Working Men's Club. It's again one of those buildings you can easily pass by without noticing and yet made such a big difference to people's lives at the time when you couldn't have access to books or education. Um, easy to forget. But the Mother's Union, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts were there during the First World War, a military clothing store. It's a nice little piece pulling it all together. Um, as is the piece on the Episcopal Charity School, 1862, 340 boys and girls um, here just on the side of us. Um, evacuees from London in 1940, closed in 1972, Exeter College 2004, and now residential. And again, it's the story behind the building which I think even if you live here, you haven't necessarily noticed that detail. So I know there are some people who are completely new to Exeter. All of this is a revelation because I've had the email. Um, and then St. Anne's Well, St. Anne's Well Brewery, um, just down and on the left, near the site of the Barnstable Inn, um, which luck, now I don't know I don't think Jane put any of the sauciness in it, but it was the place where there were extras. <laughs> um, because it was outside of the city wall. And Anne Gore was a popular figure there in the 1700s. But we don't have that. It so didn't that's include probably. that, or ghosts and things like that. I was trying to reduce the yeah. content. I mean, she... Had, She's quite a character. She actually gets involved in politics in Exeter. Um, if you saw the program Harlots, it's reminiscent of that. I hope you know what I mean. Um, anyways, four nice little pieces which, again, are slices of, of the parish. Uh, Jane Gray, Atwell Palmer Almshouse. Harder to do because there's a book that was done fairly recently on the almshouses. So how do you go further with that when it's already done? It's about different audiences as well. And you can write the most informed book. I remember I did a book in my head and department said, remember, that only four people are going to read that. <laughs> no, only six people are going to read it. Four people will understand it. Which just deflates you, you know, thinking, well, what did I waste all my time for? Well, with this, it's always finding a different audience as well. And particularly with Exeter coming and going, we're going to reach people on the net that we never would have done before. Um, but Lawrence Atwell, 1588, setting up the Atwell Almshouses, which move 24 and 3 blocks, 1839, for Paul Weavers. Um, now, we also have John Scott, who's written about the prison, um, 1850s, 1860s, 
Um, there were two in St. Thomas, one in Queen Street, one by the Guild Hall, and the famous one is the South Gate at the bottom of South Street, um, all put together with the Bridewell and the prison in the early, well, 1850s. Capital punishment didn't end until 1943. Um, done as a cross, A, B, C, D wings, there's an E wing for an admin, and then F was part of the Bridewell for debtors. Um, and to think that prison has been going now for 170 years. Um, Michelle's written on Mill on the X. Her piece is, I don't want to say it's a bad piece, but there's so much in it, we're going to have to divide it into bits because there's, it's like several put together and we need, I think, a piece on just on the cloth racks. I saw that and I thought, aha, we can do something built just around that. So we're going to take out a whole paragraph on the cloth tray because <laughs> these are the cloth racks here, there, and then on Dinham itself there and what we had was this the, the process kept changing because there's different types of cloth at different periods and plus in the 18th century there are loads of different types of cloth so the process is always very different but there's a soaping there's the rinsing with urine there's the burling there's the napping there's all these things that are going on but one of them is taking the cloth and stretching it out on the racks and from what's now the Friars College and Crescent, all the way up to Mount Didham, on both sides of the river, you had this cloth, multicolored, and it was like a rainbow. I don't want to get too top nest, but it was like a rainbow along the, both sides of the river. And visitors commented on how striking it was to go down along the river and just see this mass of color along the side. And our bit is that Mount Didham up above, um, but she's also written about the mill on the X. That's the industrial quarter, of course. Oh, yeah, I'm here. oh there you are. Sorry. Thank I couldn't see because I, I know you by face and I couldn't see yeah, you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so, um, grist mills, dyeing mills, paper mills, mm -hmm. um, series of leets, the channels going along. That's also where the um, um, ducking stool was. What's it called? Devon cucking stool um, was as well. The grisly story of Reginald Hyde, 18 months, um, Cornish girl comes up and has the baby at Eve, gives the baby over to a woman in South Street who murders the child and the bits of the body are found in the canal and the leaked. Um, <clears throat> becomes a national scandal and great interest in the murder trials. She ends up being executed. She's done. Um, he was only 18 months old in 1872. Um, the water engine down across from the mill on the X is another bit that you've written up um, with Weir Cliff on the side. 1693, it's a water company, has a water wheel to bring water into the city. It isn't good enough for cholera, but X is expanded. But it's an important part. Water from that side, and then of course before that, coming down from um, Sidwell um, Parish. And then headwear bathing. Um, it seems frivolous, but uh, and if you look at some of the engravings, all the men are naked, which I never quite know if that's actually true, but they're always shown in there. Two things which happened in the Victorian period, children dying of scalding because of the open fires, and then every year loads of young lads drowning because they don't want to swim in hot weather. Um, and the headwear was a main place for bathing in the city. So that's brought up. And if anybody wants to know more, we can um, take this up over um, nibbles later on. Um, Nicola, Nicola here? Oh, terrible piece, terrible. No. Um, really interesting on Northern Hay Street and dissecting Northern Hay Street. Um, hay meaning an enclosure. Or a bit of meadow land. It's a southern English term, but the majority of all Hays are in Exeter and East Devon. A 
think there were 16 Hayes in Exeter. You can start to pull them together. You go, oh yeah, Princess Hay was just made up, of course. So that, you know, that's a, the modern one using an old name in 1949. Um, destruction um, outside of the parish, outside of the walls in the parish in the 1640s. It's thought by 1649, nothing is left standing outside of the city walls except for a few buildings. So there's a rebuilding at that period, including the city prison. He's the man that wrote scandalous things about the government and was arrested for it and went to prison for a year and a half. Um, but the new prison had debtors, felons, and a bridewell, 36 cells. Um, she writes about um, Easton's, the stonemasons, which the building is, well, the, the site is still there, which he supplied the granite for the City War Memorial up at the top, which came from somewhere near on Dartmoor. Turkish bathhouse, um, one of our unusual buildings in the city, 1898 to 1909, only lasted 11 years, but then again the bathhouse in Southern Hay lasted for just about the same time. Um, Exeter people obviously didn't want to be clean. Um, Turkish bathhouse had a shampooing room, which conjures up images of a shampooing room. Um, and then Robert, now I think they um, Iron Bridge, that wonderful name of the pit to bring out for that area where, remember, we go down North Street and then go back up the hill um, in the earlier period until the 1830s when they decided to build the bridge. An extraordinary construction. Um, you can get used to it by crossing it, but when you go down and you look up at it, you think, what a marvelous structure it really is. Um, cast in Monmouthshire. 10,461 pounds, 14 shillings and eight pence, which I worked out at being 632,000 pounds in today's money. It seems a pretty good value. We've spent a lot less, a lot more on a lot less in the last year for all sorts of things. Um, so those are, and I've gone over my time, sorry, Russ. Um, but those are some of the things which you've written I think despite the awfulness of what we've all gone through and the difficulties of access, we've got an awful lot there. And the detail is a lot more than I've been able to, those are just the little fun bits coming out of it. There's twice as much as I've been able to talk about the subjects as well. So I think we've done well, and hopefully the public will like it as well. But right, okay, so I'll sit down. for instance, that are collected in censuses. 
But um, Sue Bond's talk really kind of opened my eyes to the breadth of resources, the mass of stuff that's out there really, um, beyond the census for sort of social and family history research. So that was really, really useful to, to, to have that. And Richard Parker's talk um, to taught me how to begin to try and start looking at the exterior of buildings um, in order to try and sort of understand a little bit more about their past. So I think, I mean, I was found it a really great toolkit, um, as I think we all were, really. Um, so I was asked to have a look at two roads, um, and the first one of these um, was Dinham Road. Um, so I think most of you here will know that the road takes its name, as John said earlier, um, from John Dinham, um, the Exeter tea merchant and benefactor, who had funded the 1862 opening of uh, the Mount Dinham um, social housing settlement. Um, but I was fascinated to discover that it actually replaced a lane um, that had led to orchards and pasture and gardens and actually a very early city refuse tip. Um, so it was really exciting for me, I think, to look for the first time in my life at um, tide maps. Um, and to learn and sort of about perches and rods and uh, and history of apportionment because that was something that was kind of completely completely new to me. Um, so having kind of got back to that point, um, I then kind of decided my next port of call really were the censuses. Um, so um, the opening of St Michael's and All Angels Church in 1868 seems really to have lent some additional status to Dillon Road. Um, and by the time of the 1881 census, there were some quite substantial villas that had started to be built. And I think it was probably it was a rapid time of growth in terms of house building. Um, and there was plentiful work for skilled sort of tradespeople here in Exeter. Um, because the occupants of Dinham Road in the 1881 census listed their trades as um, carpenters, joiners, plumbers, um, and living alongside these kind of um, tradespeople who were living with their, their, their families, there were often seen to be boarders, um, including several people who were coopers at St Anne's Brewery. So kind of a really nice sort of mix there within a sort of within a street. Um, as I made my way through the censuses, um, it was fascinating really to discover just how closely they actually reflected changing times within the city. Um, and for instance, by the time of the 1891 census for Dillon Road, um, numbers 7 to 11, which were known as Churston Terrace, had also been built. Um, and ownership of a piano and an ability to play had, had become, I think, a bit of a symbol of social status by this time, um, amongst the really probably amongst the growing Victorian middle classes in the city. Um, and I discovered that number four Dinham Road um, was occupied by a Henry Bartlett, who was a piano dealer, um, and his wife was a teacher of music. So again, another sort of strand in terms of sort of changing times, really, and sort of new Victorian in interests, I think. Um, number nine, Dinham Road, is really interesting um, because this was occupied by a William E. Hart. Um, this is recorded in the 1891 census and his family. And he was a potter who had, um, it seems, recently moved from the Alavale Pottery in Newton Abbott. Um, and he went on to establish the very successful Exeter Art Pottery um, down on X Street. Um, and I think it, it was significant, really, this pottery in, in the history of both pottery and Exeter. Um, and there are several examples apparently, I've not seen them yet, but um, in the Royal Albert Memorial Museum um, of this pottery just because of its obvious significance. And, and it comprised of sort of things like bowls and egg cups and jugs and tankards. Um, and they were um, inscribed apparently with little ditties and sort of morals 
Um, and um, basically they were there um, to supply a demand for souvenirs. Um, because from the growing number of tourists really who were making their way to Exeter and the English Riviera, um, triggered really um, by the expansion of the railways. So, you know, a market there in, in, in pottery and um, just in pottery to, to satisfy the very particular need. Um, I think, you know, um, Dinham Road, you know, it, it kind of continued to grow in, in, in wealth. And by 1891, um, some of the larger and wealthier households on the street had started to employ servants. Um, so in numbers one, four, six, and seven, um, all listed domestic helpers by, by, by 1891. Um, by the time of the 1901 census, um, numbers 12 to 18 on the opposite side of the road um, had been built. Um, and it continued to be a street, really, of very skilled craftspeople. Um, so, number four um, in, the in the 1901 census was occupied by a Charles Weber, um, who listed himself as an employer in the wood turning trade. And number eight was occupied by an apprentice wood carver. So, that tradition of wood carving and things, which is quite, you know, strong, you know, in, in here in Exeter, I think was kind of, you know, the residents of Dinham Road were, were a part of that. Um, and meanwhile, sort of dressmaking and millinery um, provided employment for five of the single females who were residents in the road in 1901. Um, and alongside this, the close proximity of St David's School, um, which had been founded back in 1868, also possibly attracted by the teachers, um, surprisingly mostly female actually, who were also residents of the road at the time. Um, it was really great really to discover from the censuses um, that they revealed some very close connections with this community centre building, um, largely during its time when it served as the Institute for the Blind. Um, so in the 1911 census, a Frederick Ford and his, Ford and his son um, were residents at number 13 Dinham Road, um, and they are listed. They were listed as piano and organ tuners. Um, and the history of the centre here does show that in the 1870s, um, music had been added to the curriculum. Um, and some pupils, um, with quite a lot of pupils in fact, going on to become piano tuners. And I think it's quite possible, really, that the Fords, you know, their background there at the corner in Ginnam Road, um, may have had a, you know, a connection with the Institute um, and um, with this sort of, with this sort of growing of this, this uh, group of piano tuners. Um, Certainly, Dinham Road offered lodgings to home workers from the Institute for the Blind, and the 1939 register um, recorded an Annie Stannard and a Mary, Fannell, uh, a Mary Farrell at number four as blind machinists, and an Arthur Holloway at number 14 was also recorded as blind. So very interesting to know that there were sort of home people, home workers, um, attached to the institute, but living in the kind of surrounding surrounding streets here. Um, I think the thing that was perhaps most sobering for me um, about the research was looking at the maps of the aerial bombing during the Blitz. And I think, I mean, it wasn't difficult to imagine um, just how very traumatic life for those blind residents um, must have been on the night of the 3rd of May 1942 when there was an absolutely huge um, firebomb um, dropped on the corner of the road down there um, adjacent to, to the Iron Bridge. And numbers one, three, seven, and eight in the road were all destroyed, um, which was obviously an act that would have left the whole street traumatized and obviously changed the fabric and the look of the street forever. So, um, yeah interesting to kind of think the way into what that experience must have been like in particular for those for those um, blind people who were resident in that street just around the corner um, 
The other street I was asked to look at um, was Telford Road, um, and its fortunes were actually, it's quite interesting, not so far away, but its fortunes very different. Um, and its development came somewhat later, and I was surprised actually to see, to looking at the old maps, um, the OS map of 1888, um, that much of the area along Bonnet Road um, was still covered with fields of that date. Um, however, I think the huge expansion of the railways and the growth of St David's Station um, clearly started to create a demand for homes for railway workers and commercial travellers as well. Um, by the time of the 1911 census, there was down there um, on Telford Road a, a terrace street of really sort of solid, single bay fronted houses that had been built to satisfy the need for homes, as I say, for railway workers. And of the 14 houses that made up the road um, in that 1911 census, no less than six were headed by employees of the railway, um, with jobs that varied, you know, from carriage examiner to cartage agent clerk. And heads of the household at numbers two, four, and six were all railway porters. So it was very, very much, I mean, the Telford Road kind of, you know, it was almost built for railway workers, isn't it? But it was very much a railway worker's street. Um, design, as we know, I mean, the, the station was designed by Brunel. It had opened on the 1st of May 1844 by the Bristol and Exeter Railway. Um, but that line to Paddington was later joined by the Exeter and Crediton Railway in 1851. And then in 1862, the London and South Western Railway. So this obviously brought lots and lots of new opportunities for tourism, business, transport of goods. And the railway industry rapidly became, in fact, I think, one of the largest employers in the country. So I was able to do the research a little bit further, and it seems that although you know wages for railway workers were generally low, employment was secure, and the railway companies were among the first to provide benefits such as pensions and sick pay and convalescent homes and staff housing and social activities. And staff took pride in their work and were loyal to the companies. And it was really interesting to note in the census returns that the residents would very often specify exactly which railway company they worked for. So it was, um, you know, it was fascinating in a way to kind of just see some more of that. Um, I discovered that in July 1914, 28,755 passengers were recorded as passing through St. David's Station. Um, but by the time I looked at, when I, when I came to look at the 1939 register, the heyday of railway employment was kind of sad, clearly sadly over, um, with just three of the streets, heads of household at that point, left in the core roles of guard and shunter and signaller. So interesting to see how kind of the peak and then the, you know, the heyday and then, you know, the, the changing fortunes of streets, which happens for all streets, doesn't it, I suppose? Um, and the 1911 census showed that the other key area of the quote for residents of Telford Road was as commercial travellers. And I hadn't really kind of known much about that kind of um, role, but it was interesting researching this, as it seems it was a job that had grown really out of a century of boom in manufacturing and an increase in disposable income, I suppose, amongst the Victorian middle classes. Um, and I was really surprised to learn that between 1871 and 1881, the number of commercial travellers in England doubled to 40,000. And although it was possible clearly to make a good living, it was a testing life based on commission and lengthy periods away from home. So as I say, you know, tough, tough people being confronted with tough situations, really. Um, you know, in different ways, in different streets. Um, so really, just in summary, I think I feel really lucky to have had the opportunity um, to keep on learning and discovering new things, really, at a time when COVID lockdowns have meant that the world otherwise, for me at least, seemed to feel as if it seemed to stand still. Um, and I think, you know, given the year and more that we've all had, it has been great to meet new people, even if only remotely. <laughs> 
um, and to being able to volunteer for something worthwhile, which has been kind of bigger than just my own small world, um, and hopefully will leave a lasting record of, of our area. Um, and in a strange kind of way, I think it's, um, I've been able to take comfort from the fact that previous residents had come through adversity and tough times here in the streets of Exeter, um, but somehow they kind of pulled through, um, you know, that life goes on. So that was kind of helped me, I suppose, in terms of what I think for all of us has been quite a challenging time. Um, and that's really all I wanted to say. Um, thank you. <laughs>